episode, we're going to look at making our editor more like an IDE. And IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment, and it essentially has a bunch of different tools to help you with your development process. These tools can be something like the ability to search through your Git history, some code completion, syntax highlighting, a way to show best practices and styles, a test interface, and so much more. So in this episode, I've stripped down my VS Code to be just one extension, and that is the Grubbox theme, which is my preferred color scheme for development. And did you know that you can go to railstore.com to get your own Ruby on Rails t-shirt or your Drift and Ruby t-shirt? So be sure to check that out and use the promo code Ruby for free shipping within the United States. And so when we're working within our code, right here I'm on a welcome controller, and let's say if I find a comment within here, and I'm thinking, okay, why is this comment in here, and, and why is there no actual function? It would be a pain to go through to see who actually made this change. But if we look for the extension, get lens, and if we install this extension, now I can see exactly who made this comment, or the code change, and we can also see what the diff was from that particular commit. This is interactive, so you are able to click on these to basically open up that file at a previous point in time to see what the changes were. And another great extension is the Ruby Solar Graph, and I'm going to install that, but I'm also going to install the Ruby Language one, just so we can get some support for the Ruby language and also debugging support. But Ruby Solar Graph is going to be more of a code completion or IntelliSense, and it can also provide some inline documentation about some of our functions and methods. In our terminal, we will need to do a gem install Solar Graph in order for this extension to work properly. So now when we start typing, we start getting some intelligent code completion as well as the IntelliSense that pops up. And for the next one, I'm going to go ahead and generate a scaffold for our users with a first name and a last name. And then I'll go ahead and run Rails DB migrate to migrate the database. And then I can run Rails tests to run our test suite. And so by default, everything passes. There is a great extension called Test Explorer, which I'll install here. And then we can get the one specific for Ruby which is a Ruby test explorer. And so between these two, we now get a new UI where we can run our tests. But on a real six application with mini tests, it doesn't seem to work. We do need to come into our test folder and into the test helper. And the specific issue is with this parallelize. We could comment this out or we could just change the number of workers to one and then this would work as well. So coming back, we can expand all of our test explorer tests and then we can run them. And we see that everything is passing. One nice thing, if I want to go to a specific test, I can click on this icon and it takes me right into this test. You can see that it keeps track of the state of that particular test. And if I change this to something else and save the file, it doesn't automatically rerun that test, but we can enable auto run so then when we save it, it's going to auto run the entire test suite again. And then you can see that we had this failing test. So it tells us what the expected result was, but then what our actual result received was. If we want, we can run this particular test again, and it's only going to run that one test. But once we fix this, we can run this one test again with run this test. And it's only going to execute that one test, and now we're back to passing. And another great extension is the RuboCop, because this will let us know if the code that we are writing maybe could be optimized or written in a better way. And so I do take these with a grain of salt. For example, back in our welcome controller, this first one is saying that it's missing a top-level class documentation comment. I really don't care to do that. So I'm going to just copy this convention the style slash documentation. And for this particular project, I'll create a dot rubocop.yaml file. I'll paste in the style slash documentation. Then I'll put in an enabled false. 
And so by doing that, when I come back and save the file, you see now that message is ignored, but now there's another one. And this frozen style string literal comment, that's not a bad thing to have within your application, but if it's one that you're just not worried about, then you can do a similar thing where we just come in and disable that particular check. But in this case, there's some actual good suggestions. I have an additional space here, which I can get rid of. And then it says annotations like to do should be all uppercase followed by a colon. So I can put a colon in here and then those conditions are satisfied. But then this one, put empty method definitions on a single line. I don't really care for that one. So I would just disable that one as well. So it could take a bit of time to build out your library of which ones that you want to follow and which ones you don't. But for the most part, you would need to figure out which ones your project is going to use. In order for the RuboCop extension to work properly, you will need to do a gem install RuboCop in order for it to work as expected. And then within Visual Studio Code by default, there's this debug and run tab, which doesn't really do anything right now because we had to first create a launch.json file. So because I already have the Ruby extension installed, once I click on the create JSON file, Ruby will pop up, then I can select the Rails server. So by default, the configuration options will work fine because I am doing this on my local development environment. If you're using Docker for your Rails application development, then you would just need to change the request from launch to attach, and then you would have to configure the remote host, remote port, and the remote workspace root. And typically these will just be your 127.0.0.1 IP address, port 3000, and the remote workspace root, you would just want to essentially put into the path of your Rails application. But for now, I'm going to leave it to launch, and I'm going to launch the Rails server by clicking on the little green icon at the top. You'll see in the debug console, we now have a Rails server up and running, and then we can visit our Rails application. But it's not really doing anything. So if we come into our Rails application, and we can go to one of our particular views, let's say on the show page, we have a lot of issues on this particular page, so on the left hand side, you can see that we get this little red circle and I can click on that and it turns into a bright red to insert a breakpoint. So now when I go to that page, I'll first need to create a user. And once I create that user, it automatically takes me out of my browser back into my editor. And you see now we have a line break there, but that doesn't really do us much good right now. But if we do come over back to the debugger, we can start inspecting things like the instance variables. In this case, here's our user instance variable. And we can see a lot of different things that's going on with this particular user, as well as the attributes. But one cool thing that we can do is come down and have expressions. So if I just type in the at user, and maybe if I also want to know what this user path is going to create, I can add that expression in there as well. And now it shows me those particular variables or methods and their essential values. The same thing can work for the edit path. And then we can see the user slash one slash edit. So this is going to be really powerful if we are working with more difficult applications. On the top right, we have some controls to stop the server, restart it. We can step in or step out. We can step over or we can continue the program. Continuing the program, it should then render the show page. But let's say if we come into our index and we know a particular user, and let's say for this user first name, we don't want to stop on the first record or maybe the second record. Maybe we want to stop on a very specific one. So we can edit the breakpoint that we create here and we can say where the user first name is equal to maybe something like John. So if we create a new user, John Doe, and then if we go back to our index page, as soon as the page loads, it takes us into our editor, and you can see that it skipped the first user, and it went to John. Because our expression user.firstName equals John gets evaluated, and before it did not pass on test, 
But now if we change it to test, we could continue the execution, come back to our application and refresh. And now it's stopped on the user with the first name of test. We are able to interact with other elements. For example, we can come up here to see this user object and we can see all the different values for this particular object. And if you've inserted in a lot of breakpoints on your application, if you just want to start fresh, down at the bottom, you have your list of breakpoints that you have set up. You can click on it to quickly navigate to that particular breakpoint, or you can deactivate all the breakpoints, or you can remove them. And once you're done with the debugging, you're able to stop the server and continue on with your development. And in order for the VS Code debugger to work properly, you do have to install the gem ruby-debug-ide, and that's also going to install the gem dbase, which is a dependency of the Ruby debug IDE. And just one final thing, and this is because of the Ruby solar graph, if there's a particular function that we have, like the application controller, we can right click and go to definition, and it'll take us to where that's defined. The same thing works on something like a class, where we can see where this user object is defined, and it takes us to the user model. And so out of the box, VS Code is really powerful and it can do quite a bit. And thanks to extensions, we can tailor our instance of Visual Studio Code to be much more powerful and more like an IDE. And so there's some other additional options that we can set up to just make our development life a little bit nicer. So if I hit the command comma to bring up the settings, we can search for white space, one option that I always have enabled is trim tailing white space. So on a file, if I have a bunch of spaces after the last actual part, and once I save it, it'll automatically get rid of those. And depending on your preferences, additional ones that I'd like to add is the VS Code icons. And it just makes my folder a little bit prettier with all the different icons. And when you're working on your development environment, you may find yourself having to switch to a different computer sometimes. And having to keep your settings in sync between both editors could be a pain. And in a recent version of VS Code, they've actually included a setting sync option, which was previously a separate extension that you had to configure. However, pulling up the command palette, if you just type setting, you can then follow the on-screen instructions to configure setting sync, and then it'll basically just upload a private gist to a connected GitHub account. So once you go over to another computer and you launch VS Code, if you have it set to configure to automatically sync, then it should pull down all your settings and your configurations. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.